Good evening, everyone. Thanks for waiting. Um, just a quick reminder, if you haven't signed in, there's a sign-in sheet up there. If you attend all four sessions of our MBA Light, you get a certificate. Uh, we also have our ongoing schedule coming um, in the back as well, as well as brochures, handouts, the whole gamut. Anyone new to our Morgan Entrepreneurship Programs? Never been here before? Okay. Oh, well, welcome. Um, we have an ongoing series, and we'll start again in January with a whole, whole, new, whole new set of speakers. So I hope you'll join us. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce John L. Sasser. Did I get it right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, he's a former senior vice president and chief information officer of the Timken Company and a lecturer at Ashland and Malone Universities on management information systems and strategy and strategic planning. He served as a startup business board member and advisor for several companies, including Arcovi. Arcovi. Okay. Um, Tiffin Metal Products, Jarrett Logistics Systems, and V2 Technology. He's an investor, a member of the East Ohio, East Central Ohio Tech Angel Fund, and the recently created Impact Angel Fund. So he will be talking to us about strategy and strategic planning. So please welcome John. Good evening. Sorry, I was a little late. Uh, I have a good excuse. Uh, that Impact Angel Fund I mentioned, uh, we just got started about uh, two months ago, formally. We've been working on getting approval from the state to have matching funds from the Third Frontier. That took longer than we expected. We finally got all of that done, and uh, we just had one of our meetings where we actually heard kind of a pitch from a, uh, a uh, start Summit County based cybersecurity startup is asking for money and so I really wanted to leave at 530 but I just couldn't get my uh, members of the investment fund to wait and stop asking questions so sorry about that okay well as I mentioned uh, I have a little bit of background in strategy uh, one is I, I got an opportunity to take the company and work under some great leaders and I'll talk about a couple of them over the course of the discussion tonight uh, I also head up, headed up our strategic planning area at Timken and learned a lot of things you shouldn't do probably from that more than anything else. I have done a little bit of teaching and actually that's a great way to learn. So if you ever get the opportunity to teach, uh, you know, hopefully you know a little bit and you'll learn more as you go through. And then I also did attend graduate school and actually studied under sort of one of the masters of competitive strategy, a guy named Michael Porter, if you've heard of him. And in fact, if you uh, I don't know if you Google or beg my name, but if you look hard enough, you'll find that I'm, I'm quoted in, uh, or I'm referenced in one of the strategy books because I did a study on the chainsaw industry. Very exciting. It's cutting edge. <laughs> okay, so, you know, what we want to do is talk a little bit about strategy tonight, strategic planning. And, and again, I don't, I'm not big on semantics, but one of the things I do want to kind of emphasize that you know, people talk a lot about strategy, like we have an IT strategy, you know, and really I don't think you can have an IT strategy. I think you can have an IT plan or you can have an IT component of your business strategy or your organizational strategy. But again, that's kind of semantics and not that important. It's more important to understand sort of at least classically what strategy is. And so when people talk about it, either you know as much or any more than they do. Uh, so anyway, with that, let's uh, start. So one of my great bosses was a British guy, and uh, Peter had a tremendously great, you know, he was everything I probably wish I could have been. He was lean and tall and thin and wore these great suits, had a great deep voice, and had this British accent. But, you know, everybody thought he was sort of like descended from the king, but actually he was from Birmingham, if anybody's from England here, and he, his, his accent was a Birmingham accent, which to English wasn't all that sophisticated, but we thought he was. So anyway, one time we were talking and he said, John, and I'm not going to try to imitate him, but if you don't like your company's performance, then either the strategy or the execution is wrong. So that's pretty important and we have a good context for discussing that. So as you look at your organization, and again, I will say, while I'll talk mostly about a for-profit business, a lot of this, you can, you can figure out what your strategy is for a nonprofit or a government agency. A little bit different, obviously your competitors are different. But still, if your strategy for any organization isn't right, you're probably not going to like the performance. On the other hand, if you've got a strategy, and every company organization has a strategy, implicitly or explicitly. Nobody may explicitly know what the strategy is, but you've got one. 
And if you've got that strategy and you're executing it badly, you probably won't like your results either. Now, one of the things I always like to think about, and if we want to talk about it again, we can. If you think, one of the things I learned at the Harvard Business School was a, a two by two matrix. I think about everything, it's sort of like a window pane, you know? And so if you think about a, a matrix which one axis, we'll call it the, uh, let's see, the X is this way, right? The X axis has bad strategy, good strategy. The Y axis has bad execution, good execution. Obviously, bad, bad, you know that's going to be a bad result, right? Bad strategy, bad execution, probably not going to be good. On the other hand, you know the other quadrant, good strategy, good execution. That's going to lead to good financial results, good organizational results. The thing I always think about as well is it better to have a bad strategy well executed or a good strategy badly executed. And so maybe you can ask me that question at the end and we can think a little bit about that. But anyway, that's what Peter told me. So what we're going to talk a little bit about today is what I consider strategy. The essence of that definition is how and where we will compete as an organization. So it's the customer, it's, 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 you know, we'll talk more about the how, we'll talk about the where, but the where obviously is customers, it's geographies, it's market segments. The how is kind of the fundamental question of do we compete on price or do we compete on differentiation? And, uh, and that's pretty important. If you, know, if, if you only come out of knowing that, how and where we will compete, that's probably good enough learning. The other thing then is strategic planning is really normally a multi-year plan that really describes how we're going to execute or implement that strategy. Jack Welch, famous CEO. Anybody ever seen Jack Welch on TV? Yeah, anybody ever met Jack Welch? No, okay. I mean, Jack Welch, tremendous business person. I think if he walked into the room here, you know, we probably wouldn't even pay attention to him. He's, you know, rather uh, not, not very large. He's got kind of a horrible Boston accent. Completely the opposite of Peter Ashton, but a great business person, too. And he said, strategy means making clear-cut choices about how to compete. And I would ask, and, or at, and where to compete. But he probably heard to say that. On the other hand, a couple of professors said, without a strategy, the organization is like a ship without a rudder. So another person one time, the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So if you don't have a strategy, or if you don't know what your strategy is, you'll get there. And a friend of mine, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I always quote him, a friend of mine named Atul Bali that I worked with uh, at, at uh, Todd Pippin Limited, he said, the Buddha said, and I don't know if this is true or not, but he said, if you know where you're going, many roads will take you there. And to me, again, that's kind of the essence of strategy. If you know what that strategy is and where you're going there, you can have some deviations, some detours, maybe even some sort of bad execution and get back on track. So maybe I already answered my question there, but if you know where you're going, many roads will take you. There's a, there's a model that uh, was developed by McKinsey and Company, actually one of their Japanese uh, partners, called the 7S model. Originally it was a 6S model, uh, but they added a 7S model, and I don't know which one it is. But anyway, these are really important to think about in, a, in an organization, design and in, in running an organization, and strategy. And these 7Ss are shared values or your superordinate vision. In other words, where are you trying to get to? And we'll talk a little bit about that in the context establishing a strategy. There's the style of the organization. So you know what kind of style do we have? That's important. And we, you know, I don't talk about it here, but in the handout you'll see that certainly the corporate culture is important to support the strategy. You can't have a strategy which is probably completely out of line with the corporate culture. As an example, Nucor, anybody know Nucor, the steel company? Uh, Mini mill producer, you know, their headquarters originally were in a strip shopping center in Charlotte, North Carolina. Very lean, very, uh, you know, no cost, which was the same as their strategy. Low cost, many bills located close to the customer. Uh, you know, you wouldn't expect to see Nucor headquartered on Park Avenue in New York. On the other hand, if you were probably somebody like uh, one of the high fashion organizations, Atlanta, what is it, uh, L something B, Louis Vuitton, somebody. Anyway, you probably wouldn't be a, you would probably be headquartered in a strip shopping center in Charlotte either. So there's kind of a style that needs to be all have to fit together. If you think about this a little bit, it's like a nucleus where all these seven S's kind of have to fit together to support each other. Strategy, we're going to talk about that. Skills is interesting when skills is typically your organizational skills. What are you good at in an organization? And uh, 
We'll talk a little bit about that. In, 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 in strategic parlance, that's normally considered your core competency. So, you know, if you're a technical company, you're really good at, on the bearing side, you're really good at engineering your products and applying them. If you're a technical company on the steel side, of course, those two companies split last year, you're really good at manufacturing and execution. And so when you think about both building your strategy and then reinforcing and implementing, you've got to make sure you reinforce the skills that support your strategy that you need. And anybody here from HR? Well, you know, HR, well, it's hard to figure out why do we have an HR department? But, uh, you know, you do need one because one of the things the HR department has to make sure is that we're reinforcing those skills. We're bringing in people that have those skills that we need, that we're giving training, that, that builds the skills, that we have reward systems that reward the skills. So that's pretty important. Staffing is really just kind of the right numbers of people in the right places. If you put the book, uh, you know, having the right people on the right seats of the bus, that's kind of that. It's not skills or organizational skills. Staffing is the actual people that populate the organization. Systems can be information systems, obviously very important, but they can also be, you know, manual processes, procedures, etc. And then, you know, the last one is structure. And I purposely put structure last because a lot of people, when they think about, you know, an organization, whether it's organizational redesign or kind of thing, they well, what's the structure? You know, the, uh, another person told me, and I don't know who it was, said that structure follows strategy. So build your strategy and then make sure your structure supports that. Don't kind of come up with a structure and then say, okay, now it's our strategy. So anyway, let's all get together. If you Google 7S model, you can read a lot more about it than I told you. So let's talk a little bit about making a strategy. So I talked about that superordinate vision. When you think about the first step, now again, maybe in this case we're sort of pretending like we've got a brand new company and now we're going to come up with a strategy. Uh, but you know, you may be looking at your existing company and saying, you know, I got a, I don't like the financial results. I think that well, Peter Ashton told me, so I, I need to think about developing a new strategy. So really, a strategy develops starts with developing a vision. Where do we want to get? That. And what we'll do is the second phase will be to translate that into some objectives that we can measure, uh, make sense. You know, so if we want to be, uh, uh, you know, have a certain profitability, we want to have a certain market share. Uh, we'll translate that strategic vision into objectives. So, you know, for example, if we want to be uh, have a certain, you know, we want to be a high tech company in the emerging markets, then we might, one of our objectives might be to get an X percent market share in. India in this area or in China in our market segment. And you know, again, and maybe in a handout, but certainly if you think about it, you know, you want those objectives to be a balance, a balance between sort of strategic and, and, and financial, if you will, between short term and long term. A lot of times strategic strategic objectives, particularly in the short term, have to be measured in milestones. If we say as an example that we want to have a certain, you know, our part of our vision is to have a, a dominant market position in a certain product line, but we don't necessarily have that product line yet. Obviously, some milestones in getting there would be developing that product. And so for a while, we would say, okay, our measurement of strategic accomplishment is, you know, did we develop a prototype, did that work, did we develop, you know, kind of a, a low line model, et cetera. And then all of we translate that into that question of did we get the market share or market position we wanted. Uh, you know, a lot of people, too, back in this vision side, uh, Think about mission and vision, and they are different. Uh, again, I did read a good book. There's a, there's a book called Simplified Strategic Planning. If you really want to kind of read more on strategic planning, but not get a highly academic uh, journal, it's called Simplified Strategic Planning. But one of the things they say, which I think is true, and I've seen this, you know, if you start getting really hung up on mission and vision, then just sort of stop and go out of your strategy because you're, you're probably wordsmithing. And, and see if you can develop your strategy, and then maybe work back again. I wouldn't recommend that necessarily, but you can get kind of hung up on that issue of mission and vision, and maybe spend days on that, and then spend 10 minutes on the strategy. You don't want to do that. Uh, but mission typically describes who we are. Not where we want to go, but who we are. So you know, our mission might be that we're a for-profit company or a nonprofit organization that does such and such in such and such market. That's kind of who we are. Uh, you know, I think, again, if you, if you think about a company like uh, Heinz over here, we'll talk about Heinz Commercial Store. You know, my guess is their mission is, you know, from Heinz? And, you know, their mission is to provide high quality uh, grocery choice to, you know, in, in upper income areas or something. Now, you know, their strategy, I can tell you what that is in a few minutes, but anyway. So, uh, 
Develop that vision in the context of your mission, who you are and where do you want to go. Tra you know, quantify and qualify those that vision in terms of strategic objectives. Then you got to say, okay, now what's the strategy that's going to get me to those objectives, to those uh, measures and objectives? Then, we, assuming we find one, and of course, what, one of the things you see here is kind of these arrows all circle around because, you know, one of the things we may find, we set our vision, and we may find as we start setting our objectives that, that something's not right. We, we can't come up with objectives to satisfy that mission, so maybe we have to go back and adjust the, uh, the mission. I'm sorry, I said mission to vision a little bit. Likewise, as we start to actually craft the strategy, we may find that we've got to go back and adjust those objectives a little bit. I don't know, does this thing work? I'm colorblind, so I can't see. Is there a red dot there? No. No, no. okay. Oh, I'll have to log in, maybe. No. You don't have one on here. Oh, well, all right. So that's why it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so we craft the objective, we develop the strategy, then obviously we implement and execute. And of course, in developing that strategy, there's a lot of work of filling out the things below that, and we'll see that in a minute. But uh, then you start implementing it, executing it, and of course, very importantly, you monitor. So you know, as we said, you know, this is our strategy, or this is our vision. You know, it's going to be to do this in these marketplaces. Then we build a strategy, and then we start implementing. If things aren't going like we want. Again, think back about what Peter asked us for. We asked ourselves, first of all, are we executing it badly? Maybe we just need to go back, kind of. Uh, that actually one of these that works. Let me see here. Okay. Okay. So, you know, as we monitor it over here, we may then say, okay, well, let's just go back and kind of work on the execution a little bit. Maybe we just missed a couple milestones and that's the only problem. Or, you know, maybe we've got the strategy a little bit off and we've got to work back. And, you know, again, you, you may find yourself, you know, kind of working a little bit here in a circle. Now, of course, the important thing is, you know, you don't want to turn it into almost like a fan where you're look at those things so often and changing so often that nothing stays constant. So, you know, be careful of sort of over, over measuring maybe and over adjusting uh, because again, sometimes things take a little bit of time to sort of uh, work themselves out. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, then, so when you think about a strategy, we'll come back and talk about corporate strategy in a minute, but I do want to talk a little bit about that terminology because a lot of times people will say, what's your corporate strategy? Well, Corporate strategy, and I'll, uh, I'll talk about it in the last slide, really, again, sort of in the, uh, in the classical definition, corporate strategy is the decision about how many businesses you're going to be in, the different businesses you're going to be in. So if we take a company like Timken, three years ago, their corporate strategy was to be a bearing and steel. If we talk about Heinen's, their strategy is to be a, you know, a grocery store. If we talk their corporate strategy, and they just they, they just have a single business unit. Tim can have two. My guess is if you look at like Walmart, they have at least two business units for sure, and maybe three. I'm going to say that for sure they have a Walmart business unit, but I'm not sure that that's not a grocery store business unit and a whatever their other thing is, a department store type business unit underneath it. I don't I don't even know the Walmart organization chart or a strategy uh, business unit uh, definitions. Then the other would be their wholesale club, Sam's Club. So they're at least in two businesses, and uh, they might be in three. Is there trucking type well, of business? Well, you know, that probably comes down, it, it could be, they offer it to other people, but it probably comes down into a functional strategy, which, you know, again, I said it shouldn't be called out, but it is here. Uh, you know, a, a classic example of one of the most, well, let me ask you, who do you think might be a the best example of a multi-business unit Company, you know, with their, with their corporate strategy, you have to be in all sorts of businesses. Does anybody have a have a company that immediately comes to mind? You got it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if you think about this as a continuum, so we have a single single business company like Heinen's or even Timken today. Is that work better than this one? So, yeah, what's your hack? So, if you think about it, you got Heinz and the 
the new Timken Bearing Company and the Timken Steel Company has single business unit companies over on one side of this continuum, and Berkshire Hathaway is on the other side. And we'll talk about their kind of corporate strategy, their, 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 uh, the way they do that. But then right past, right past Berkshire Hathaway would be a mutual fund, almost. And then if you think, if you kind of work back from Berkshire Hathaway towards Timken and Heinen's, you would find somebody like GE, very diversified. But there's a connection between their business units. And then if you go back to the old Timpy company, which was a very and steel, they were definitely committed, they were definitely connected. The steel company was a supplier to the very company. That's how they got started. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But anyway, the diversified company, the first question that managers have to decide, typically the highest level managers, okay, what is our corporate strategy? Are we going to be a single business unit company? Or are we going to be a multi-business unit company? The next thing that they develop are the business strategies, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, but that's kind of that chart we just looked at. Those business strategies then have to translate into functional plans, I'll call them. I like that better than functional strategies. But it is to be that, you know, here's our trucking, trucking uh, activities to support the kind of supply chain we want in, uh, in Walmart. And I think Walmart a few years ago, maybe two years ago, decided they could do trucking better than their suppliers. So they really said we're just going to use our own trucking activities. But I don't think they offer those to anybody else to invest more now. So it's an internal captive activity. So it's really a functional part of Walmart. And then ultimately that translates down into kind of like, hey, what do I do today? The operating plans that we have. If you think about a single business unit company, we just take that, we've already made that decision. We're a single business unit. Therefore, we, fun we focus on our business strategy, our functional strategies, and our operating strategies. So as we think about, again, developing a strategy, one of the important things is to think about the environment that we operate in. You know, no company is an island, and uh, we're right in the middle of this, we do sort of like an island, but anyway, in this model, when you think about, in terms of starting to think about your strategy, so I'm kind of imagining that we're in an organization that either isn't happy with our financial results, maybe we have new owners, they want, they want to kind of rethink our strategy, maybe we're a new company, I mean, I, I will tell you, I, I don't think Polly mentioned this, I don't think she did. I own a restaurant, so I'm going to give out cards for that. Uh, and is anybody here in your restaurant business? Oh, no. But I did this, you know, I worked for Timothy for 31 years, and I, I wanted to preserve this historic building and have kind of a destination restaurant in the little town I lived in in Zor. So I opened up a restaurant. And, uh, you know, some of the ways I had to think about, well, what's the environment that I operate in? So, you know, if you think about it, if, if you do your plan, you know, whether it's a new company or existing, when you think about that sort of outer ring here, which are the big factors that impact your business. So what are the general economic conditions? You know, what kind of regulation and legislative changes are, are coming about that affect my business? You got the population demographics, you know, again, if we're in the care, that's probably good if we have a grain population. If we're Johnson's diapers, you know, maybe, or, uh, yeah, what is it, uh, Johnson Johnson baby powder, maybe not so good. Uh, societal values and lifestyles and technology. Clearly, those are all external factors that are impacting uh, me, our company, and our industry. Then as you come into the inside here, we've actually got kind of our industry, which is comprised of, and we'll talk more about this in the next slide, but we're here to build a company. We've got obviously suppliers. We've got buyers, our customers. We've got competitors. We've got, you know, potential uh, new entrants, maybe it's a, a bank, maybe it's a company in China, maybe it's somebody down the road. In my case, it might be a restaurant, you know, in the next town. And then we've got substitute products. So, you know, again, if we were more bold on making uh, flip phones, a substitute product was, in fact, you know, a smartphone. And so, you know, you need to look at that and figure out how all of those things affect your business as kind of the starting point of your environmental assessment, if you will. Michael Porter, my professor, uh, he developed this concept, which is kind of a little bit like we think about it. You know, Michael Porter's model of applied forces of contact center, and that is he's, he's merged the our competitors and us together. So basically, the people directly in the industry are right here. So that's us, and that's our direct competitors. You know, obviously there's a lot of competition if you think about it if you're doing this analysis between you and your direct competitors. People are trying to build a market share, they're trying to take away this customer, they're changing their pricing. 
you know, again, if you think about it, if your uh, highness sitting over here, I guess you worry about, you know, is Giant Eagle going to make a uh, call market? Uh, you know, for the Giant Eagle kind of high end place to call market something. Mm -hmm. Market district, they got to put a market district. Uh, you know, is Whole Foods going to open up a store in Akron? Yes, it is. So, you know, they might worry a little bit about those things. Then, obviously, as we saw in that other slide, we, we asked ourselves, you know, what kind of pressures do we get from our buyers? You know, if you think about this, part of what we're trying to do is just figure out what the dynamics in this industry. You know, are the buyers extremely strong? Are they going to basically tell us, here's what we're going to buy at? Or do we have a lot of marketing power? So imagine, uh, you know, do you think Highlands worries a lot about its buyers from a pricing standpoint? Do we have an idea? Not really. I mean, yeah, they do. Obviously, they want to be in the market, but they're not really worried about you coming in and saying, "Hey, I'm only going to pay you three dollars for this uh, thing." You know, you're going to take it. You, know, you may not come in, but you're not going to dictate price to them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you're a Tim and you're selling bearings to GM, you know, they are going to dictate. They're going to say, "Here's the price we're willing to pay." You know, you're going to have to figure out can you make money on that. Obviously, that has some big strategic implications. On the other hand, you know, in some sense, in some industries. Suppliers are really important to understand. How much pressure can they put on us? Uh, you know, again, in many cases, uh, not a lot. But I think in the case of Heinen, it's probably quite a bit. Uh, my guess is that uh, p and is pretty strong about what they sell their stuff at, so they probably dictate prices. They probably dictate terms. And so, you know, there's a lot of pressure from that. Again, it's going to have to influence the strategy you pick. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to figure out, you know, give this market we operating in, you know, what's the right strategy for it? Likewise, we may have to worry about new entrants. Are there some people out here thinking about getting into our industry and offering a similar product, maybe better, maybe at a lower price? And then, of course, the other thing is, are there firms and industries that offer substitute products? And in fact, you know, they're not our competitor today. They're going to bring in a product that's going to compete with us. So again, the question is, well, what do we have to do to react to that in terms of developing our strategy. So that is, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about building this vision and you're building your strategies, you've got to do this external assessment where you look at the industry. And that's kind of what this is a shortcut for. If you think about it a little bit, one of, the, one of the things you can do to help you think through where you sit in an industry and, and, and how the factors play out is to build something called a strategic grouping map, uh, where you pick a couple dimensions of differentiation or a competition, if you will. So in this case, we put down model variety, those who offer a lot of models, those who don't offer so many models, and here kind of a price performance reputation. And so you know, if you look at it, of course, this is a little bit old, but probably still somewhat true. Uh, you know, obviously, Hyundai and Suzuki are down here. Fewer models at a lower price and performance. General Motors, many models, but still not necessarily pretty high. You have Porsche and Ferrari at the top, and very few models with high price than all these other people here. And obviously, the, the implication of this is that people that are right next to each other, they tend to be the strongest competitors with each other. I mean, certainly, I don't know that Ford worries a lot about Ferrari. And I'm sure Ferrari doesn't worry a lot about Ford. I know that when they bought uh, Aston Martin, which of course is a lot. But so if you think about it, if you're looking, if you can do this for your industry, for your competitors, you can kind of say, okay, you know, the person that's closest to me are the ones I really got to worry about. In my case, you know, I have two restaurants within three miles of me. One of them kind of serves a similar price point, similar kind of thing. And I'm not a, they're, they're more Italian, I'm, I'm more American and German because the Zorro's a German town. But, but still, we're kind of going after the same people. Uh, there's another one which is kind of a cheap burger and a beer sports bar. Well, I don't really compete with them. Yes, there are people that sometimes walk in there and I like to get to over to my restaurant. But I really am not competing with them. You know, I'm to them, I'm up here and they're, they're down here. So, you know, again, I, I really shouldn't get my strategy too focused on those guys. I really need to think about the guys who are a little further away and going after the same customer base I am. So that's a good model for kind of saying, here's, here's what the industry looks like. But what we're really trying to do is we look at the strategy and all this external analysis and that industry analysis is to figure out. How do we make us a successful player in the industry? And an important concept here is that, you know, 
we can think of industries that we say, oh, that's not really a great industry. It's kind of, the suppliers are really strong, the buyers are really strong. It's not very attractive. It doesn't look like you make a lot of money. But that's not really true. In fact, depending on your strategy and how well you execute them, you can do very well in, a, in, a, in what we might define as an unattractive industry. Unattractive means hard to make returns. Now, Warren Buffett one time said, when a business executive with a reputation for success meets, a, meets an industry with a reputation for difficult economics, the industry usually wins. So it's not easy to do, but you can. And uh, again, one of the things we did a number of years ago at, at Timken, we looked at, we did an analysis of, of industries and said, okay, let's look at, let's get some data. And we worked with McKinsey on this, you know, very good, very good consulting firm. And said, let's get uh, the profitability, I think we use return on equity or return on investment, of a number of industries. So let's, let's chart those from, uh, you know, certain, just on an x-axis. So what we found was we could actually array kind of all the industries in the world in the United States on kind of a curve that went from either low to high or high to low. With, as an example, oil and gas being very high return on their investments, and this was a while ago, and steel being really low. And again, if you go back and think of that industry analysis, why was steel low? Well, you know, they have pretty strong suppliers of raw materials, their buyers are pretty strong, you know, and you're selling to the auto companies, they say, now, you know, you're a commodity, here's what we're going to pay for you. There's threats of, you know, entrants like aluminum. There's threats of uh, or substitute products like aluminum. There's threats of new entrants like Chinese and Indian steel makers. So all these things tended to make the steel industry look pretty bad on an industry return, and therefore you say, not very attractive industry. On the other hand, you know, oil and gas, a lot of power over your, you know, basically they say, here's the price of we put it up you know, on the gas station. They own the resources in many cases, and so that's pretty attractive. You know, not a whole lot of substitutes for oil uh, other than natural gas, so that's changed a little bit. But so there, you know, that's a pretty attractive issue. All those factors we can look at said pretty interesting. So you know, it would be easy to be successful in the oil and gas industry. Pretty tough to be successful in the steel industry, but you can. And we talked about new forms. So then, what we did is we took the companies in that steel industry. The steel industry had a return much less than the average for, let's say, the markets in the United States. But when we arrayed the steel, individual steel companies on that same dimension of profitability, we found that there were some steel companies that did really well. A lot of them did, but the average was pretty crappy. But some of them did really well. You know why? Because they figured out a way to capture good economics in a difficult industry. In the case of Newcorp, they said, you know, we're going to really focus on cost. And we're going to locate our mini, well, first of all, we're going to use mini mills. We're going to locate ourselves close to our customers to reduce transportation costs. We're going to have non-union facilities, we're going to try to, and we're going to have some really great incentives to get people productive. And so, you know, they were able to find a strategy that in a difficult industry, if we did all that industry analysis, we would have said, ah, hey, you know, don't bother doing it. They found a way to be successful. So that gave us part of the tip that, you know, short of making the corporate strategy decision to get out of the steel industry, that we just needed to figure out a strategy within that that would allow us to do well. Now, funny story about sort of industry attractiveness and corporate strategy, too. There was a railroad in Illinois, and I don't remember who they were now. But they really, you know, they were, this was back in, the, I believe, the 80s, I think. They were doing very well on any kind of return. And if you think about it, you know, again, what Peter Ashton said, they, they were doing well. They didn't know whether they had a strategic problem or an execution, but I think they concluded that it was a bad industry. The railroad industry was just not a good industry, not an attractive one, or they couldn't figure out ways to capture it. So they actually sold off their railroad operations to somebody else. And they took the money. They bought a candy company called Whitman Sample, Whitman Candies. So here's a, rail, a bunch of railroad management executives that get out of one industry because it's not attractive. They couldn't figure out a way to be successful with the strategy, and they took the money and made a corporate strategy decision to become a candy company. So somebody asked, first of all, tell this story. Somebody asked him, you know, well, how did they perform then after they made this corporate strategy decision? They said, well, they did better than they did as a railroad, but they weren't the best performing candy company either. 
So, you know, it gives it back again. So, you know, they improved themselves, but, but of course, most, most uh, traditional sort of finance and economics people would say what they should have done is sold the railroad business and give the money back to their shareholders, shareholders and let you invest in Mars King. Well, it's a pretty private. But anyway, let you make the decision about what industries you want to have, uh, invest in, not them. But that's kind of a, one of the dilemmas of corporate strategy is should companies make the portfolio decisions or should they? Let their shareholders do it. Of course, that's assuming it's a public company. It's your own company, you can do anything you want. So, again, that's really what we're trying to do. The whole essence of, of strategy, that could, how and where we compete, is to figure out a how and where that allows us to be successful in whatever the industry is. Unless that industry is so bad, we just make a corporate strategy and get out of it. Uh, the other piece is so we've done this, we've done this external analysis. The other thing, obviously, we want to do is look at our internal skills. You've all heard of SWAT. Uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat, uh, threats. You know, for a company strategy to be good, to be well conceived and well developed, you got to match it to your strengths and weaknesses. You think back about that uh, set of assets, it's got to be matched to your skills, your organizational skills. It's no, it's no good to say, well, I've got a strategy to be high tech, but I have no engineers or no designers or whatever the basis of your technology is. Or, you know, to be high, to really have a great brand. And they have no tremendous, you know, brand managers, and so you know you've got to make sure that it's matched. And, uh, and again, that's part of then figuring out how, given a certain industry, can we take a strategy, leverage our strengths, minimize or obviate our weaknesses, take advantage of the threats, and kind of move around, or, uh, take advantage of the opportunity to move around the threat. Uh, you know, and again, what's important on this is, you know, a lot of times when I, I see this again, this can get into a lot of semantics. And in terms of uh, strengths, again, remember, these are internal. So don't tell me that a strength is that uh, you're better than your competitor on something. That might be a strength, but I think you really need to be more internal. What are we really good at? Yes, if we're better than our competitors, that's good. But let's make sure that we talk about that. And where I see a lot of times the weakness will be that our competitor is better than us. Now, that's really, that's, you know, the weakness is that you're not good at it. You know, it's not your competitor's position. It's your, but I understand it's kind of relativity here a little bit. Again, yeah, opportunities are those things, are these fast growing markets? Uh, you know, that may sound kind of external, and yes, it is a little bit, but, but it is really the opportunities that present themselves right to us. How can we capitalize on those? And one of the threats. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of an important piece of the internal analysis. We have the external analysis, we have the internal. And then, so what Michael Porter said is the competitive strategy is about being different. It means deliberately choosing to perform activities differently or to do different activities than our competitors to deliver a unique mix of value. So what we're really trying to do is take that external analysis, the internal analysis, and figure out how we can be different from the people in that box of right in the middle of the five forces or right in the middle, you know, us and the rivals to that donut type of design. And that's what we're trying to do is say, how can we be basically a monopoly is what we're trying to do, in a good sense. We're trying to be a virtuous monopoly. We're not trying to do it by price fixing or work on our competitors' carbon markets. We're trying to find a way to a group of customers we can be a virtual or a virtuous monopoly. The basic strategies that people have to choose from to do that is kind of, a, again, that window uh, analysis I talked about, there's really two basic forms of strategy. This is, again, a very important concept. You either focus on price or you focus on differentiation. Price being this left column, differentiation being the right column. If I look at my, if I look at my old employer, the Timken Company, the steel company effectively was a price-based slash cost-based competitor. They were, even though there were high-end commodities, they were still commodities to some degree. And you're not going to get away from competing on price and cost with that. On the other hand, the bearing side really wanted to be a differentiator. They wanted to provide differentiated value to the customers. And uh, that's really an important concept. Differentiation versus price. So ultimately, Michael Porter would say a whole bunch of other strategic things. When you come down to, to defining your strategy, that's the first thing you got to say is do I compete on price or do I compete on differentiation? 
Um, and I'll give you a good example of, of how you can differentiate in a tough market. This is a Timken example. Uh, in the 80s, the bearing market in the U.S. really changed as the Japanese car companies started coming into the United States and as the U.S. car companies started moving from rear-wheel drive to front-wheel drive vehicles. This was a huge impact on Timken because we had a tremendous market share with the U.S. companies, particularly Ford and Chrysler, a little less than GM, but that changed also. We got a lot of GM later. Um, but we also had bearings that were really designed for rear wheel drive cars. So again, our financial performance was plummeting. We went from having a record earnings in 1980, I believe, second, third year out was in 10 and two, the first loss was 1924, in 1982, I believe, or 81. It was all because of this change in the world. We didn't do probably as good an external analysis as we should have, you know, getting ready for this. So this is pretty hard. And what we had to do is, we suddenly were put in a position where we had to, we had to really compete on, on, on price. Japanese were excellent manufacturers of bearings, and they could uh, produce, they, and maybe they didn't care about making money or as much money as we did too. That's a, that's a whole other factor in that economic, that macroeconomic analysis that your customers have the same effect as you do. They say the worst better than somebody that doesn't make money. And uh, it, it is true that the Japanese primarily Europeans secondarily don't expect the same kind of financial returns as American companies in general. So if you can meet head to head with a Japanese company, you know, your, your, your costs are immediately higher if you have a higher cost of capital than you do. But anyway, ignoring that. So Tim, you know, saw this thing where bearings, you know, were, we were getting more and more pressure. First of all, the market was smaller and we were getting more and more pressure on prices. So we had to really think about, you know, competing on cost, on price and cost. Tim Timken, our old chairman, our former chairman, you always got very angry because you could buy a pizza. The pizza costs more money than a highly engineered steel bearing that we invested, you know, millions to build the plants and millions in research. We just couldn't figure out how that was possible. But anyway, so what we did is we, we thought, well, how can we differentiate? And I can't tell you that this was necessarily, you know, we start out exactly this way. This is true of a lot of strategies. One of the uh, classic uh, strategy, uh, one of the classic companies that people used to define a great strategy is Southwest Airlines. So let me give you a continue for just a minute. So, you know, if you think about Southwest Airlines, you know, they, they have a whole bunch of attributes that are the hallmark of their strategy. So first of all, let me ask you, how do you think, what do you think uh, Southwest fits on this cost versus differentiation? Where do you think they fit up? Which, which strategy do they pick? No, price. Yeah, I mean it's price. Now, you know, it is true that price is one form of differentiation, but they really compete on price. And therefore, to compete on price, to compete on price, you have to have low cost. So what is what is Southwest done to have low cost? Any any ideas? Only well, we one aircraft model. Yeah, 737, so that makes it real easy for a whole bunch of reasons. Your parts are all the same, your replacement parts, you know, when you go to load up the planes. You don't have to worry about, oh, this plane only has 80 seats and this has 120. Now what we do with the, you know, the 40 people uh, fit the same, you know, fit the same jet weight and all those kind of things. All sorts of reasons why having the same plane is easy. In fact, when they bought Air Tram, one of the first things they did was to sell those DC-9s, I mean, the MD-88s, whatever they are, uh, to Delta. So they could focus back on their 737s. They also use airports like Acton Camp as much as they can because they're cheaper than flying into other airports. Obviously, they can't ignore population centers. They use a spoke, they use a spoke uh, and hub, but they use a spoke method as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the way the, uh, the hubs that they probably have carrier issues. Not a lot of thrills. You know, AirTran had a first class or a business class. You know, we won't find that at top class. They don't have a seat reservation system. You know, you, you line up, that's the reservation system with those little uh, lines there. So they've saved the money on that. Uh, you know, all the reservations have to be done online, so, you know, again, they don't have to have a bunch of people answering, as many people answering uh, phone calls. They're not, they're not paying agents commissions. You can't, can't go through a travel agent, I don't think, to, to get a Southwest ticket. So they tuned their, they either built their strategy around their capabilities, which was to be, you know, they, they started off in Texas as kind of a, a regional carrier. So there's always that question, did they, did they plan from the very beginning, the guys who started Southwest, to do that probably not? You know, again, they sort of, I'm sure, moved into that. Well, that's what happened with so I mentioned we, we had to do something. And what we ended up doing, this is the ultimate of differentiation in the business.
business to business. You know, in, in the consumer market, we can differentiate on kind of smoke and mirror sometimes. You know, we can use brand. You know, we can say, well, you got to have, you know, a Rolex watch, or you got to have a Mercedes Benz, even though a Hyundai will get you almost certainly the same place, but not the same time. So we we can we, we can use a little bit more of the pizzazz in the consumer market. And this is the business. It's not much tougher to do. So what we did, a ticket, a great example of uh, differentiation in the business to business market. We had a, an application where we sold two bearings for about maybe let's say six or seven dollars per wheel. So what we realized was that the cost to the user was a lot more than that. When GM bought those bearings for six or seven dollars to a, for that wheel, they had to press those into a hub. They had to adjust them. They had to put in a sensor. They had to put in grease. They had to put in a seal. They had to uh, install it all. Then they had to worry about warranty claims because there were warranty claims. So what we did is we developed a bearing that cost about four, that, that we priced at about forty dollars to replace seven dollars. They said we'll take it because what it did is what, what it differentiated on was their cost structure. And we were able to eliminate all of that adjustment, all of that grease, all of the seal they were buying. Their warranty cost went way down because we put a sensor inside the bearing so the rocks didn't get it. And so they were very happy to pay us $40 instead of $7. And they, now we weren't competing with the Japanese anymore because they couldn't do it, at least for a while. And so what we did is we differentiated on something that brought value to the customer. I guess just like you know, differentiating on car styling brings value to the customer that values a nicely designed car. It's just most handy. So that was a, that's a good example. If you ever think about why we differentiate, you know, in you know, in a business to business or a non-consumer, you look at what you know, you look at what's important to the customer, what's the cost of them to use it, what's their life cycle costs. You know, another another good example in the business to business world is kind of Intel. Intel had an Intel inside, you know. They were basically allowed, they were by their quality, they were allowing their customers to have credibility they wouldn't have without it. So customers were probably for a long time willing to pay more for the Intel chip than they did for uh, whatever the competitors were. So that's the differentiation versus cost. And again, we think about our friends in Dr. Road Heinz, they're clearly differentiated uh, one way. Anybody know all these? You know, they have like South West Band. I mean, all these is differentiated, they're purely cost-based. Uh, and if you look at it, you know, they. They, uh, they locate in kind of the opposite market that Heineken locates here. So the other piece of this dimension is the market target. So if you think about that, how we started, we said the strategy is how we compete. So the how is cost or price versus differentiation. And the where is do we go after a narrow target, a customer, a niche, or do we go after the broad market? So again, if you think about you know the grocery industry, we definitely would put we definitely would put Heinz here. We would put probably uh, Whole Foods and Mustard Seed Market over here. We would probably put Aldi over here. You know, they're not they're not trying to sell low cost stuff in Hudson. You know, I don't think is there an Aldi in Hudson. Okay. Uh, so Aldi's over here. Heinz is over here. Uh, clearly, who's up here in the grocery industry? Broad differentiating, uh, broad broad low cost. Let's say broad low cost. Who's there? Walmart, yeah. And then, you know, I think the question in the, in the grocery industry, and I don't know it that well, you know, who's over here? I guess Giant Eagle, Kroger's, people like that, you know. And, and I'm sure they're sort of somewhere in here. It's, it's, it's pretty clear to me in the grocery industry that I know where Walmart is and I know where all those other guys are. I'm, I'm, I always have a little trouble figuring out where Giant Eagle is. You know, Giant Eagle, anybody work for Giant Eagle? Um, you know, they're really not very low price. They're low price when something's on sale. But otherwise, they're not. That's their stretch. So anyway, there is another, there is a kind of a fifth generic strategy to think about. It's called the best cost provider. And I don't know whether it really is a distinct strategy. I think if you if you want to be crisp about strategies and you're thinking about it, I would focus on the four. You know, am I going to compete on price or am I going to differentiate? Am I going after a niche or am I going after the broad market? But there is this other one which does kind of manifest itself called the best cost provider. And uh, probably one of the best examples of that is probably Toyota. And that is that Toyota, you know, they pretty much go after the whole market. They're pretty, 
quite too competitive. But you know, they're not they're not competitive. And you know, they don't differentiate that much. And so the, the idea is that somebody like that, they kind of figured out a way to almost cross over between the price market and the and the differentiated market. Now, whether they differentiate, they don't differentiate clearly as much as Mercedes, although they try to make the product look like them. But, uh, but you know, so they, they may be an example. There may be others like that. But, you know, the next one that is frequently referenced is the best cost in the market. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend a lot of time thinking about that. So that's kind of, let me just go back here for a minute. So that's kind of the essence of strategy. You focus on cost and price. And, and again, it's, what's, what's very important is, just like we saw in the case of Southwest and, and Walmart, if you're going to be a price-based competitor, you better focus on your cost. If you can't be a price-based competitor and have high cost, because what happens? You're going to go out of business. If you're going to compete on low price and you don't have the lowest cost in the industry, you're not going to survive. Uh, on the other hand, you know when you differentiate, you've got to be at least competitive on your cost. You don't have to be the lowest cost. So when Tim can make those nice bearings that were much you know, much more differentiated than the other ones. They still had to worry about cost. They still had to make sure that they bought the right steel at the right price, that their manufacturing was good, because if they left too much space there in terms of inefficiency, they were allowed that people would move in there pretty quickly. So again, differentiation doesn't mean you can ignore cost, but it means that cost isn't the thing you wake up every morning thinking about. When you're a cost-based company, every morning you wake up and say, how do I reduce my cost? How do I reduce my cost? If you're a differentiated company, you say, how do I improve my differentiation? How do I make sure that I you know, create that, that uh, position in the marketplace that my customers love me and they're willing to not worry about the guys that compete on price if they buy my product? So that's kind of the essence of competitive strategy. And then I'd be talking about on a diversification of corporate credit. Just a quick concept on that. When you think about diversification in terms of corporate strategy, there's really two models. We talked about Berkshire Hathaway. They focus on unrelated diversification. So when they get into businesses, they don't worry about the fact that Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad doesn't have a lot to do with Heinz pickles. You know, what they say is, we're going to buy them at the right price, and we're going to manage them well. Our, our advantage, our, our synergy, if you will, in multiple businesses is that we're, we provide good management capabilities and probably capital to businesses, and we move capital around between business units to feed the ones that are growing and have more possibilities and, and take it away from the ones that don't. And so that's what they do. Now, if you look at GE, GE's kind of a little bit of both, because if you look historically, and I know that's changing some, but uh, GE Capital, even though they did a lot of independent financing, they also financed a lot of GE items, like GE engines, like GE X-ray systems. And so, uh, Berkshire Hathaway would be very much the, perf the poster child for unrelated diversification. GE would be kind of in the middle. And then off to the left is the related diversification, where we say, you know, we're not going to diversify if it doesn't somehow fit into some of our internal strengths uh, and, and keep it So you take a look at Smuckers. Anybody work for Smuckers here? Okay. Well, I think Smuckers is a great company in Northeast Ohio. And you know, I think it's a bit of a debate, you know, how many business units do they really have? They would say coffee is a different business unit than jam. And I'm sure that pet food is a different business unit. They just bought a pet food company you now. But but you know, when you think about smuggers, when they buy things, what what, they, what do you think they're looking for? Is they, you know, they, they, when we, you know, when smuckers started a, a well, I I went over and talked to some people, smuckers about 15 years ago, they were really struggling with how do we grow? They did a lot of internal growth things, like St. Paul could come up with some new products. So one thing is they came, they, had, they sort of developed some, some brainstorming teams with the help of an outside consultant. They came up with something called the Uncrustable. Have you ever seen that? You know, it's kind of like a you know, ready-made frozen peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Use their, use their jelly, you know. But then they went off, that didn't, that didn't do a lot for them. They didn't really come out a lot. It's when they went off and they bought Jeff and Crisco. So now they had the peanut butter to go with the jam. Uh, but what were they really looking? Were they looking for peanut butter and jelly for, for making sandwiches? What do you think they were looking for? Well, they were looking for products, but what they were really looking for is high-quality brands like Smuckers that they could take to 
what they call the middle of the store in terms of the aisles. So if you look, what they what they've done is they really focus on their ability to manage high quality brands. They don't go off and say, okay, now that gin peanut butter is Smucker's peanut butter. No, they keep it. They keep it. Gin, they, they pay a lot of money for that brand. But what they do is they manage the brand. They manage the logistics of getting them in. Obviously, yeah, I, I would guess in many cases, the same truck brings them in. And so they have said there's a fit in our supply chain and some of our capabilities of brand management. And on the other hand. Again, it's looking thick, and they got into steel because it was an integral part of their bearings. And they said, hey, if we have good steel, we can sell better bearings, and there's a fit there. So, you know, again, an important concept, you know, if you're talking about small business, is this really that important? Eh, maybe not. I have, I'm on board of a small company. I won't uh, probably mention that. I won't say who they are. But this guy, he knows the company, and he makes a lot of unrelated diversification decisions because he has the money to do it. He has the time. Now, the question I have, of course, always for him, he does these. I said, you know, so and so, what are you going to, what are these things going to start distracting you too much from the core business, which is really a good business? So, when you go off and buy real estate that isn't really related to your business, you know, is that a good thing? When you buy, when you, when you buy a franchise for food, you know, is that a good thing? I mean, he likes them and they're doing well. But you know, it's, but there's certainly no there's no relation between them other than the fact that the same guy owns it. So normally in small businesses, that's not either either the diversification is just because the owner wants to do it, or you know because it does make some kind of do some kind of related aspect. So. That's I think yeah. So we talked about you know the essence of strategy is where we compete and how how being price versus differentiation, where the what group of customers think about it that way, you know. Uh, and, and don't necessarily think that the how means domestic versus international. It could be, you know, in, my, in a case of my restaurant, I take a very distinct group of customers. Uh, you know, obviously restaurants are pretty local, but I still, uh, in my own mind, at least, have created the, the how of that. And uh, that's important. You know, you do that in the context of that economic analysis of the industry, the macro world, with your internal strengths. And uh, again, what you try to do really is create a virtual monopoly where there's a group of customers out there, whether they value price or whether they value some other attribute, they love you and you're able to make money in even the worst of industries. Okay, questions? I don't know that's good or not. Yes? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I mean, government's a little more difficult, but I think if you take pieces of the government, you can. Because again, if you look at a lot of government agencies, you kind of say, you know, well, you know, what's their vision of what they're trying to do? And, you know, is there a strategy to, you know, effectively deliver service on a differentiating basis or on a cost basis? Uh, I think certainly if you get into the nonprofit world, there's a lot more opportunity to look at that. Again, if I'm, uh, you know, you think about it in the nonprofit world, because they don't have the ability to take money from you directly. They have to, they, they, they actually compete, nonprofits compete between each other in two ways. One, sometimes they compete directly. So if I'm the uh, African Museum of Art, you know, I'm competing with the Cleveland Art Museum too, right, for people that are interested in art. But I'm also competing probably with, uh, you know, you may not agree with this, but I'm probably competing with the African, where the rubber ducks for entertainment a little bit. So there's that. Plus, I'm also competing for money. So when, you know, when I look at contributors and donors, if I'm a nonprofit, you know, there's that aspect of contribution too. So certainly in the case, you know, I think of museums, uh, well, and, and, and other uh, hospitals would be a good example too. In fact, I'm teaching a class over national right now, and I've got a student who works, I believe, for the Cleveland Clinic. Well, she's going to do a strategic analysis on uh, uh, Metro, Metro Health, I think it is, in Cleveland. And you know what she wish her her initial uh, sort of supposition is that Metro Hospital really competes on price and cost. The Cleveland Clinic competes on differentiation. And so you know the question then is if you're Metro Health, how do you make sure if you made that decision that that's the right thing? Okay, you got to do that based on all this economic analysis and in terms of what you're what you're good at and all those seven S's. The question is how does that how does the Metro Health 
make money or not lose money uh, following a price-based, cost-based competition against the clinic in the same market, the university hospital. So yeah, the government for sure, I think there is probably more just about being clear about your objectives and how you do it. The competition isn't quite as relevant. Sorry, it's one answer. Yeah. Um, hey, I already know his name. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously with, with a lot of the economic challenges over the last 15 years, you've got companies that are going through turnarounds, then you've got startups, and you've got maybe one that has been around for years and realize that, boy, we just got to change. Are there, I don't say templates, is there something, the strategy for each one of those is going to be a little bit different. Obviously. Is there a, a rule of thumb or maybe things on the web or um, part of the startup has got a very different level of strategy than if you're talking to the At the end of the day, yeah, you've got to make money, you've got to serve customers, you've got to be hard, but there's a cultural thing going yeah. on. Yeah, well, I think on the turnaround, again, if you think back about the process, I'm assuming that the reason is a turnaround is because you're not satisfied with the results somehow, either, either profitability or market growth or, or stock price you know, as a public company. So I guess the first step would be to say, you know, if, I, if, I, if I'm in the company that's a turnaround, whether it's private or public, I would say, uh, you know, do I think I have a strategic problem or do I have an execution problem? And I go back. You know, I go back and look at that, 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 you know, maybe again, it's just when you look at it, maybe that macroeconomic analysis is clear as day that, you know, the world's changed and you didn't realize it. And you're still offering the same thing, but the world changed and doesn't want that. So, it's, it, you know, it's a strategic problem. Uh, or on the other hand, you know, maybe you do all that work and you say, hey, you know, this is a still right strategy, but we just did a pretty good job of executing it. Maybe, we, you know, maybe we're trying to differentiate but we've let our cost get bloated in some area. Maybe we're trying to compete on, on cost, but we kind of just lost, taking the ball off of that. So I think the, you know, not that it's easy, but that's what I would say is try to analyze from that external and internal analysis what's going wrong on, on the turnaround company. Uh, and then on the startup, I think the important thing on the startup is to you know, obviously, I'm assuming you've done all the work to say that there's a market out there and people need this thing. Uh, now the question is again, how, you know, first of all, we're going after a niche of the whole market and, you know, how do we go after that market? Do we have to be the lowest cost supplier out there? Lowest price, I should say. And therefore, I really got to work on cost with my products and my, you know, logistics or engineers or whatever. And in fact, I saw a case of the company we were looking at today, you know, they, uh, they developed the first generation of their product in the U.S. back in Cleveland, and then they went into a second generation, and they looked at their cost, and they ended up doing a fair amount of it in the industry. As I said, you know, to get the cost we want, we've got to do some of this. So they kind of went, even though they're they're certainly going to, I think they're going to compete on differentiation, but they do certainly have to worry about that on the cost. So I think a startup is it's just important to be clear about, are you going after a niche? Going after a broad market, you can be a price of a I mean, obviously, something like Apple, they're not a startup, but they, they, they are all about differentiation. You have to really worry much about you know, their, their price. I mean, they, again, you can't be out of the marketplace, but they're definitely not price based. You know what's interesting about Apple, too? You talk about the, you know, kind of the internal the, the swan. You know, Apple doesn't make anything. You know, their, 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 their strength is. Brand management, design, technology, and buying offshore. And then customer you know, service and customer delight. And they're not a manufacturer. Uh, you know, they, they, they concluded that if they were a manufacturer, they probably couldn't do those other things. And again, that's kind of the other the other advice and strategy somebody gave me is, you know, strategy is as much about what you're not going to do as what you are going to do. So Maybe you know, it's a very clear strategy. We shouldn't be any effect. Any other questions? Yeah. All that you can do is have to convince the bigger than the whole team's goal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of times. I mean, one of the things, you know, we talk about those strengths versus weaknesses. Uh, and, and looking at the external market, you know, those, are hard, those are hard facts to come up with. Sometimes, you know, and uh, in, in some cases, 
there are plenty of markets, you know, and again, you like to say that you, it's a very pure thing, you only compete on differentiation, you only compete on price. You know, that's a nice luxury to have. In many cases, you don't have that luxury. Uh, so we did have some markets where we had to compete on price, and it was hard to get people to recognize that. We bought a plant in Poland, as an example. Good bearings, but they were definitely commodity bearings. There was a need for them, we could make money on it because they had the right cost, but it was really hard. I, my boss, we, uh, we bought this plant, and they had a different kind of material and process than we did. And that was important to us, that material process, and we kind of hung a lot of our, our sort of brand promise on that, which I understand. But we bought this plant in Poland, and they immediately wanted to do the same thing there. Well, part of the beauty of this plant was it didn't have that. They could compete in some different markets. And uh, my boss said, well, this is not, this is not Peter. This is another boss. He said, well, John, if we do that, these bearings won't last 400,000 miles in somebody's car. And I said, well, who cares? You know, who wants a car that lasts 400,000 miles? You know, so they don't care about the bearings. They want them to last, you know, how, how long does people keep their car? 100,000 miles? I don't know. Some people, 150. So you don't care. It's the buyer of the car. And you as GM, how long do you worry? You know, your warranty is, I don't know, maybe 7,500,000 miles, I don't even know. So you don't care after that. I mean, so don't, 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 don't differentiate on something that people don't value. So that was always tough. And then the other thing we talked about sometimes is that issue of strange weeks. We said, well, we're really a good manufacturer. This is other bearings. So I said, I don't think we're right. The Japanese are really good bearing manufacturers. We're not. So we had in some kind of way, we could improve on that, work on that. But we also, it did tell us that we really needed to focus on we're not a bad manufacturer, but we weren't the world's best. Dark Hope. Other questions? Yeah? Is there a, a good strategy to team up with another company that's going the same thing? Well, that, yeah, that's a whole other discussion, which, you know, that was a great question. Uh, there's a whole other aspect of, you know, when you, when you start thinking about how do I implement my strategy? And again, think back on, the, on that SWOT analysis. So, you know, if we have a strategy to do something, and then we look at our SWATs and our strengths and our weaknesses, and we say, you know, we really need this strength, and we don't have it. I mean, here's a good example. Again, Timken, uh, uh, we wanted to go into India, but we didn't have any folks in India. We had left India back in the, uh, from a selling standpoint, back, I think, in the 60s for a whole bunch of reasons. And so, even though the Indian market was very attractive, we just didn't have the strengths, we didn't have the organizational skills to think of that 7S model to go after an all new market like that. And so, what we ended up doing is creating a joint venture with Tata. It's a, you know, a tremendous Indian company that now makes Jaguars. I always find it ironic that, you know, that this, this icon of British uh, manufacturing Jaguar and Land Rover are owned by an Indian company. That's sort of the ultimate turnaround. You know, but, uh, um, so we, 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 we formed an alliance, a joint venture, to create a new company to go after the Indian market. Likewise, uh, you, know, we look, you, know, you can look and say, well, okay, you know, I want to go after a new technology. Maybe we don't have the engineers in place right now, but there's an organization that does. And therefore, we team up with them and create an alliance, which is usually not equity-based, or a joint venture, which is equity-based, or we make all the decision and we acquire it. So that's that. That's the implementation of that related diversification. If we say, you know, we need this skill to go after that, we might just buy a whole company to get that skill. People do that. So, absolutely great question. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not always easy, but uh, a good way to get strengths that you don't have, or to eliminate weaknesses you have, I guess is a better way to say it, is in fact to create a, a relationship, alliance, joint venture, or an, an acquisition of somebody that does. Anything else? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, 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 it, it, there's really two pieces. The, the the upfront piece is relatively analytical. You know, it's really good if you can take the time to look at your competitors, see what their results are, understand how they compete. Obviously, do all that external market analysis. You know, kind of facilitation of the internal discussions. So that's very analytical. And then the implementation of it is kind of blocking the tactic. You know, so that's that's the nice thing is, you know, that 
automobile and business, and, you know, I think diverse, you know, it's, a, it's a great example of functional, how important functional diversity is. If you had an organization filled with those analytical people who could do the good front end, that couldn't implement it, would be in trouble. On the other hand, you have a bunch of, you know, people that are really good at implementation, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts, but they can't sort of sit back and do the analysis, you're going to be in trouble. So, both roles, but I think typically the strategic analysis piece tends to be analytical. Uh, I think it's a one level up from marketing. You know, a lot of people think of marketing as advertising and uh, that kind of stuff. But really, really, marketing is picking the markets you're going to go after and how you, you know, how you please those customers. Again, it's really a strategy. So, a strategy fundamentally is kind of a, a, a marketing plus something a higher level. Anything else? Well, I thank you, and uh, you know, I'm always my contact. If any of you do have you know, strategic questions about you know a company you're thinking about starting, or a uh, you know or a company you know for whatever reason you want you just like to talk, I mean, I think I'm, I'm happy if you give people my email. They ask, and I'll you know I'll tell you what I think. And uh, you know don't don't sue me. It's not right. <laughs> Now, Chris, if you come to my restaurant at dinner, I'll give you advice while you're eating. <laughs>